How are we all doing today? Yay! Yes! Let's get that clap on. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dylan, are we, are we good? All right, yay. I, did, I realized I didn't check in with you and I apologize. I love you. <laughs> so, hello again. On behalf of myself, my name is Martine Green Rogers. I am the president of the Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas. <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of myself, Brian Quirt, the, uh, who's our board chair. Brian, are you in here? Brian? Brian? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> I saw him somewhere. Uh, the board, our executive committee, our past president, Ken Trenelia, and our president-elect, Brian, oh, no, there's Brian Quirt. <laughs> and, and our past president, Ken Trenelia. <laughs> welcome, welcome to LDA 2019 Crossing Borders Part 2, Action in a Time of Division in the Amazing City of Chicago. <laughs> If you noticed, the, the title of this conference says part two, which means there will be a part three. Dun, dun, dun. Which we will talk about at the annual general meeting that I encourage all of you to come to at 4 p.m. on Saturday. <laughs> so there are a few thank yous and some housekeeping things that we need to do before we get started. So first and foremost, I want to introduce our conference committee. There's our VP of conferences, Amy Brooks who is not able to be here because she's busy doing the things dramaturgs do. <laughs> Which is amazing. And so I just wanna go on record saying uh, thank you to Amy for all of her hard work and her service in terms of helping create a conference. And then we have Marin Robinson over here. <laughs> Yasmin, oh, I'm gonna do it now just because I practice her name so much, okay. Yasmin Mikhail? Mikhail. Oh, so close. Is, is she out there? Okay. <laughs> Karen Jean Martinson. Whee! There's Yasmin. <laughs> and Lindsay Barr. So really quick, I'm gonna have all the conference committee people put their hand up in the air one more time. If there are any issues, questions, concerns, et cetera, please feel free to find one of us or one of the team leaders in a room. Pretty pleased with the cherry on top. We are the people who can help you get your problem solved the most quickly and efficiently. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm going to invite Ken, our past president up here, to provide a few words about an important vote that we need to do at the AGM. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here representing uh, our organization's bylaws. Um, uh, I stand on the shoulders uh, uh, of many past presidents who have also worked on uh, the bylaws. We're very close to uh, the end of this part of the journey. The last time they were revised was uh, were in um, 2005. Um, spearheaded by Didi Cooler, who is here, um, and will take all the responsibility for that. And uh, no, they're they're essential for any kind of organization that's incorporated. We have bylaws, and the goal of the bylaws is to be as clear about our mission and organization without being too specific, so that we can change the way that we do things more quickly with our leadership on the board and, and executive committee. Um, so we've been through vetting them. We've been through. Um, looking at the most recent, we're incorporated in New York State, and so New York State has certain laws about its corporations, and so we've been trying to become in compliance with those things, particularly, uh, uh, there's a lot of language around how the board is constituted and runs, and um, um, some conflict of interest policies, which they recommend we put in the bylaws, which means the bylaws are now twice as long as they once were. Um, so don't get confused by that. We're still running the way that we've been running for um, over 30 years. Um, but we do need to look at those. So I think Marin has printed out some copies to look. We went over them last night in the board meeting. We've made a couple of tweaks about quorum, what constitutes quorum when we need to take a vote around um, who we elect for our leadership and actually changing the bylaws. 
Um, so what we need to do is as many people as possible, um, uh, if you could attend the uh, annual general meeting, um, we do need to take uh, um, a vote at that meeting to adopt these revisions to the bylaws. But in the next two days, if you want to read them over, if you have any questions, we can talk. If there's an essential word to change, we can do that. Um, and then we'll take the uh, we'll take the vote on Saturday. So thank you for doing that. It's um it's boring for many people, but it's essential and actually embedded in the bylaws a lot of what, why we're here and how we um, govern ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on that note, I also want to introduce one more person to you, Emily Wise, who is here representing Heather Halinski, who is our VP for Freelancers. So Emily, if I can get you to come up and do your, give us the awesome information. <laughs> Hello, I'm Emily. I'm here representing the Freelancers subcommittee. Um, Heather is our VP of the Freelancers, and she is not able to be here, but I'm going to be your point person for all things freelance at this conference. So if you have any questions, concerns, ideas about what LMDA can do to help you that you want me to convey to Heather, um, please let me know between sessions. Also, um, Heather and LMDA are conducting a study on freelancers and economics, and if you want to participate in this study, which is completely confidential, I will take down your name and email address and send you to Heather. Um, she'll be compiling all of that information and doing interviews from, or I guess, not interviews, but conversations from now until December of this year. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to say. Um, I think that's it, but if you have any questions about freelancing, please come find me. Thank you, Emily. So a few more housekeeping things. Number one, if you are tweeting or putting things on Instagram, all that fun stuff, please use the hashtag LMDA19, so LMDA19, uh, as you post about the conference. And then Sierra, are you right there with the hand up in the air, waving it around like she just doesn't care? Uh, <laughs> please check in with her if you're interested in live tweeting a particular session. Part of the reason why we're just asking people to check in is that we want to make sure there's coverage in all of the rooms that want coverage. And on that note as well, if you're doing a panel in which you feel it would be more useful to the conversation, if there wasn't live tweeting or if there wasn't the HowlRound broadcast in there, please let us know so that we don't invade people's privacy and the ability to have fruitful conversations for fear that it will live in the archives forever and ever, amen. <laughs> so please just see either myself, the team captain, one of the conference coordinators, or Sierra, in order to make sure you let those wish wishes be known. Thank you. Uh, and then, uh, speaking of HowlRound, I want to introduce Dylan Iregas, who's up there. Uh, video uh, live streaming our conference for us thank you so much for your service we're so happy to have Al around here <laughs> i've already gotten one uh i've gotten one text from uh one of our members in mexico uh emilio who is just thanking the heavens for <laughs> the fact that Howl Round is doing what they do so thank you for what you do and i think we have one other group that is is there another group that's live tweeting for us or am i making that up So for those who were watching that could not hear that, potentially, the Grappler is here also, and they are live tweeting for us. So thank you so much to them as well. So here's a list of people we need to thank and why we need to thank them. Number one, thank you so much, Columbia College in Chicago, and especially Pete Dooley for opening up your space and your time and your resources to us. The Goodman Theater, and especially Tanya Palmer for allowing us to use their space and for their generous uh, contributions in terms of time and space and resources to us, and uh, Tanuja Jagannath and Lucas Garcia, who we will, you will find out very shortly why I'm thanking them. <laughs> the New Play Exchange, Timeline Theater Company, the University of Chicago, the Master of Arts program in the Humanities, 
Free Street Theater, Chicago Shakes, the uh, theater school at DePaul, uh, SUNY New Paltz, and our Lessing Circle patrons who helped bring a colleague from Mexico City to this conference this time around. And just so you know, if you weren't aware, haven't seen all of the amazing ways we've been spamming your email for the past couple of months about <laughs> things going on with the conference, here are some things that you should know about. Number one, we still have tickets available for six at Chicago Shakes. I believe there's still some tickets left at Timeline for Too Heavy for Your Pocket. We also, uh, in a sort of late-breaking thing, the Chicago Dramatists, if you're local, they're offering a week-long new play dramaturgy intensive. Um, that's uh, in July from the 20th through the 21st, and they are offering a 40% partner discount. So if you're interested in attending that intensive, please let me know or anyone on the conference committee know, and we will get that information to you. Uh, oh, for people who are going to Timeline and Chicago Shakes over the next couple of days, we do have a sign-up sheet in order to help facilitate getting people uh, either lifted or Ubered or whatever your transportation mode of choice is <laughs> to those performances. So please uh, go out there and sign up for those if that is something that you're concerned about or want to make sure that you're going with other people, etc. And this is something, and these, these are a couple more things, and then I promise I will get out of everyone's face. Uh, number one, just want to remind people, in case you did not know, we do have a few members who have fragrance allergies. So please be mindful of that as you prepare yourself during the day for, uh, to get ready for the day's conference. Um, and please don't be offended if someone says that they need to remove themselves from your presence because, <laughs> because you may be uh, you know, physically uh, affecting them in some way. <laughs> Bathrooms are in the basement, uh, the second, third floor, and fifth. And they're all gender restrooms in the basement and third floor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, have the AGM on Saturday at 4 p.m. Please attend. Uh, I am so happy that each and every one of you decided to join us today, either here in person or through the fantabulous interwebs. And uh, I'm excited about the next couple of days of conversation, of fellowship, and discovery. And please take advantage of all of the amazing things that Chicago has to offer. This is a fun town with a lot going on all the time. So, <laughs> so just enjoy the amazing art, artistry, and, Chica and, and uh, artists. We do have a quiet room. Remind me again, where is it located? Fifth floor? 511. 511. So if you need a space to just decompress and not be surrounded by people all the time, just so you know, we have coloring books and other fun things to help calm yourself. So <laughs> please go in that room and use as needed. Um, and on that note, I am going to turn this over uh, to Tanuja Jagannath and Lucas Garcia to do our land acknowledgement. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tanuja Davy Jagernoth, and I'm a playwright, dramaturg, producer, and advisor living and working in Chicago. My name is Lucas Garcia, and I'm a writer and dramaturg from Albuquerque, New Mexico, living and working in Chicago. Our indigenous ancestors did not call the land we're living and breathing on this weekend home, so while we're thankful that you all are here with us, we cannot welcome you. In the spirit of the theme of this conference, crossing borders and dismantling them, the organizing team wanted to hold space at the beginning of the weekend to acknowledge the land that we gather on, commune, at, and work on. We invite all of you to participate in these acknowledgements with us using our breath and witness. There is no obligation, there is only intention. We invite you at this moment to close your eyes if you feel comfortable, um, and to take a deep breath or two. And feel the floor beneath you, 
the ground beneath the floor and reach into the earth as it turns. Reach up to the ceiling and the sky beyond that, the sun, the moon, and the cosmos beyond that. Breathe deep again. We are here together, breathing, connecting, sharing, and vibrating with each other. While we do this, keep breathing. I was born in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana, a former British colony. Before the British colonized the land, it was the home of the Amerindians, specifically several different tribes of indigenous people, the Warus, Arawaks, Wapistianas, the Aragunas, Akawayos, Batamunas, Waiwais, and the Makusis. When I was one year old, my parents and I were sponsored by my uncles to come to the United States. We moved to Arizona, land that was once inhabited by 16 different tribes. I lived there for 21 years before moving to Chicago. I am a fourth generation product of settler colonialism. I came to this land in 2015 after graduating from college in Indiana on the territory of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi in search of work in the theater community. I was born on the ancestral homeland of the people of Isleta Pueblo. My mother is descended from Europeans who settled on the ancestral homeland of the people of Jemez Pueblo, and my father from the indigenous people of Mexico. We believe we are from the Biwaritari, but we don't have a way of knowing right now. My paternal ancestors crossed into territory controlled by the United States in 1917 and settled in the state of Kansas. The U.S. invaded the Mexican-controlled territory that my mother's ancestors lived on in the 1840s and moved the border south over them through violent conquest. Part of the knowledge and language we are sharing today is borrowed from the resolution introduced and later passed with censure to the Chicago City Council by the Shy Nations Youth Council, sponsored by the Alderman of the 35th Ward in November of 2018. We are gathered, breathing, working, and creating on the ancestral homeland to the Council of Three Fires, Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi, along with dozens of tribes, including the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk, who cultivated and molded the land to sustainably suit their needs since time immemorial. We acknowledge that the treaties made with the people of the Three Fires have not been honored, and the destruction and dispossession of land and life of indigenous peoples continues up to this day. We acknowledge that this land was and is a site of trade, travel, and healing for indigenous people since time immemorial. We also want to acknowledge that while some of our ancestors, especially those of us who are black and brown, did not come to Turtle Island and to this land willingly, or were taken and displaced from their homelands by economic or militarized violence, we must still contend with how we are beneficiaries of ongoing imperial violence and how settler colonial mindsets work through us and on us. Today we face, as many of our ancestors faced, systemic violence and oppression. We offer this acknowledgement as one way of standing in solidarity with the indigenous people who live and still live here. We offer this acknowledgement as one way of holding pain, rage, and sorrow with our indigenous siblings, just as much as joy, healing, and peace. We offer this acknowledgement as one way of seeking freedom and body. There are 75,000 tribal members in Illinois today, and many of them live in Chicago. You can support them by supporting Native-led organizations, working in a variety of ways to preserve their sovereignty and culture, cultivate community, and enable erased and displaced peoples to flourish. Check out the work of organizations like the American Indian Center, the Shy Nations Youth Council, and the International Indigenous Youth Council. Support Native art and artists, organizers, activists, and people in your home and work communities in concrete ways, and move with awareness, compassion, and bravery. 
No matter where you're coming from or how you got here, we invite you to move with respectfully with us on this land and in this space. In the space of this conference, we hope that we can all agree to the following agreements and practices. First, be brave. Two, listen to hear. Three, approach sessions with open minds and open hearts. And four, take care of and check in with yourself. We could all take a collective breath again, if you would like. Thank you for sharing, us, sharing with us in this way. Thank you. so much, Lucas and Tanuja, for your work in gathering us together. Uh, I, I'm sure I've probably forgotten something, and so I apologize in advance for that. So if you see me running across the stage screaming random things at you, it's because I forgot something. But <laughs> in, 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 the, in the meantime, uh, just to make sure that everyone's aware, all of the sessions that are happening in the specific rooms are posted outside the rooms every day. And please take, if you haven't downloaded Sketch already, please do that, because that will keep all of our up-to-date, changes in the moment, fun times, yay conference, <laughs> shenanigans and tomfoolery in one place for you. <laughs> so we're running a little ahead, and so I want to know, should we give everyone just like a few minutes to breathe and then come back and introduce, or do you think we should just, does it matter? Okay, cool. All right, we're going to keep rolling. <laughs> So with that, we are going to move directly into our keynote performance. So please help me in welcoming the Free Street Theater Youth Ensemble featuring their show, Parched. Hello everybody, my name is Tien, and I'm a member of Free Street's Youth Performance Ensemble. This summer, actually this weekend, Free Street celebrates their 50th anniversary. So, okay, yeah. So for 50 years, we've been creating work for, by, about, with, and in Chicago's diverse community. Each year, our ensemble, the Free Street Youth Performance Ensemble, investigates a specific theme affecting Chicago's youth. This year, we investigated about water justices and injustices. This is a portion of that play, and we hope you enjoy it. And we know you'll enjoy it. But we also know it's 10 a.m. in the morning, and that coffee may not have kicked in yet. <laughs> but these kids, these teens, these youth, me, we're pouring everything we have into this place. So if you see something funny, laugh at it. If you see something angry, be mad at it. <laughs> and just to try that out, oh, you're already doing it. <laughs> Let's uh, pretend to laugh. I'll do a joke. Why did chicken cross the road? <laughs> by the car. Oh! Okay. <laughs> so without further ado, we present Parched.
everyone drink Fiji water? I don't even like the taste of water. Oh! Oh! Whatever. I used to hate the taste of water. I'm pretty sure that we can all agree here that this shit, it's pretty bland. So whenever I go to drink something, I just need the orange juice and I'm pop. And also I was a big coffee drinker. And I guess that, on top of energy drinks, on top of five hour energy, really pushed my body to its limits. Without the necessary stuff, which I soon came to find out, is water. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm ashamed to admit it now, but I didn't actively drink water for maybe three to four years. Whenever I'd be driving, I'd get insomnia. Whenever I'd be driving, I'd get sick, dizzy. And sometimes I even had trouble sleeping at night because of like insomnia. But I'd go to the doctor and they'd always do the general thing and say, well, there's really nothing we can see that's going wrong. And I'm like, okay, like something's not quite right. Like, are y'all doing y'all job or what? <laughs>
1968, Hong Kong. Because of the drought, water had to be rationed. Each person could only get one pail of water to bring home for use and consumption for one week. In my house in Cuba, we can't drink the water there, so we have to travel, walk, miles and miles to only get three bottles of water. In my city in Ethiopia, the water is not safe or local. You have to walk to get your water, and that water would still make you sick. When I visit my family in Morocco, there's always this issue with not drinking water from the tap. Although my Moroccan family does it, my parents would have to stop to get water bottles. The situation left my family feeling confused and questioning how clean their water really was. I, I do this every day. Every day. Every day. day. Every day. Every day. day. day.
if we reverse it? Yeah, let's reverse it. Water. You know, one of the 
biggest problems in Flint right now is that even some foundations that received money, a majority of it, we still don't know what happened to it. There's no public documentation of what money went where and where it is now. And y'all know there's people coming here, writing grants, saying that they're doing things, taking advantage of this. And then there's people giving y'all money. Lots of it. Y'all know how rich people are, but what does the community get? Y'all know there was a school up there that had rooms and rooms full of water cages just sitting in it. And it all went bad because no one told us that it was there. They're wasting water, and there's a water bill crisis. And we come to find out that there are leaks in the pipes. I mean, don't get me wrong. The pipes were bad before, but now they are worse. And we come to find out that homeowners are paying for it. I mean, I pay upwards to $200 a month. And at first, they were giving us time to come up with the money. And we're like, um, skirt. We're not going to give you the cash amount of rates for something that you all caused. And then they start putting notices up on our homes. They start shutting our water off. And we protest. But this issue, it needs to be resolved. And another thing, people are bringing so many plastic water bottles here. There's so much plastic. Bring up pipe replacements. And every hot water in Flint needs to be replaced. Because when you boil hot water, and especially if it has lead, if it has lead in it, it makes it even worse. So don't do that. <laughs> but another thing, I mean, if you want to bring us water, that is much appreciated. But let's solve the actual problem. Bring us pipe replacements. Thank you. 
for double T. And a quick tag. Anybody? <laughs> okay, right there. Fight it. Hello, oh, please come up. Uh, ooh, would you mind sitting just cross legged like this? Or? Yeah. Okay, hi. <laughs> Everybody, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I love the place for water transit. I was born in Guangzhou, port city, surrounded by canals and bridges. And my mother's family is from Sichuan, a place I only remember by salt ground and muddy water, of which I spent my early childhood four years. And Chicago, a city connected to the largest source of fresh water in the world. Cool. 
control room, reverse my brain back, turning down flipping sides on the sidewalk, adjacent to my dark red brick home. Running, laughter, bruising. March 1986, the Chicago Tribune. More than a decade after other major American cities outlaw lead in new water pipes, Chicago hopes to overcome resistance from the Plumbers Union and enact a similar ban here. Imagine finding out that the pipes you assumed were safe for decades, because why shouldn't they be? That those pipes were slowly poisoning you. That because politicians were slow to act, you ingested this toxin for years. Damage done to your body because of political inefficiency. It sounds like it can't be true, but at least everything was okay. Well, no, but everything seemed okay. Chicago passed a ban on lead water pipes later that year and took steps to update this dangerous infrastructure. But then, <laughs> September 2013, the Chicago Tribune. EPA warns modernizing water systems may boost levels of lead. What? <laughs> okay, first of all, why is there a 27 year gap between articles on lead and the water? <laughs> Did the crisis just disappear between news outbreaks, or was it still there all along? Also, why aren't our politicians telling us this information directly? This is fucked up. Sorry, this is messed up. <laughs> but look, March 2014, the Chicago Tribune. How to protect yourself from lead exposure in the drinking water. Great. Why should we have to protect ourselves from water contamination? Isn't that the city's responsibility? Hey, you're doing a pretty shitty job. <laughs> February 2016, the Chicago Tribune. As other cities dig up lead pipes, Chicago resists. Great. The Guardian 2016. Chicago residents blame city for water contamination in class action lawsuit. The Chicago Tribune 2018. Judge says city's pipes cause water contamination, but throws out class action lawsuit. November 2018, the Chicago Tribune. City knew about elevated lead risk with water meters back in 2013. Splendid. April 2019, Twitter. New numbers quietly reported to the IEPA by the Chicago Water Department show the city has many more lead water lines than previously thought. About 393,000 lead lines, with another 120,000 left unknown. In any case, previous mayors have left it up to Lori Lightfoot to clean up the situation. All of these stories about lead in our water are gaining traction now, after so much damage has been done that the city knew about and could have prevented. The city said, yes, we recognize that this is happening to you, but that's not our problem. What can we do? We need our new mayor to pay to replace lead water lines leading into our homes. We need our new governor to resist water privatization at all costs. We need to stop being bystanders to injustices targeted at specific communities. So fuck this. No, fuck this. We need clean water now.
send out a newsletter or anything. They let us drink out those fountains for weeks and they never told us a thing. I had to find out three years later from my own research. And the fact that me and my peers thought we had access to clean water when we didn't is kind of fucked up. And in that case, I always cared about water, but I never thought water injustice would affect me. Even now while talking about it, how relevant it is, I never knew how prevalent it would be in my life. Having clean water is important. It nurtures us, it refreshes us, it helps us grow. It heals and protects us. So we need to protect water. These are all the schools that have lead in their water. And although they're all over, there is a pattern. 80% of these schools are in neighborhoods that are predominantly people of color. And 74% of schools with lead, students of color, make up 80% or more of the student population. Lead in Chicago public schools almost exclusively affects students of color. Does this really seem like an accident? Because it's not just our schools, it's our homes too. Homes on the west and south sides of Chicago, which as we know are predominantly black, are more likely to have higher elevated levels of lead in their water. Our city should be working as hard as possible to ensure that teens of every race have access to clean water in their schools, homes, and lives without worrying about the cost. I look back at this whole year, and I reflect on how much I didn't know.
Okay, so we're gonna do a uh, quick uh, count of six, and then we're just gonna <laughs> zoom right in. <laughs> so the song is Moon River, so if you're familiar. <laughs> So we get a prompt and then we have two, five, or like ten minutes, uh, <laughs> depending on what kind of day it is, uh, to uh, come up with whatever we can. And then a lot of a lot of the times from those sort of um, 
basic ideas that we come up with, we either work in the future rehearsals on expanding those, or we just keep them and we're like, yes, this is awesome, go on. Like, yeah. yeah. You can keep that one, because now we have two. Oh. <laughs> Fancy. Okay, so another question I have is, what is the most surprising thing that you learned while working on this process? Mm -hmm. Maybe three or four of you can speak to that. Um, if you couldn't tell from like the Nestle baby killing thing we did in the ASMR, that makes everyone uncomfortable. And um, we had a little talk back after like testing performances we had back in the winter. And um, somebody told us that and they were like, we really want you to like do a little story on that or something. So we put that in there and that was really surprising to me and like the fact that nobody knows it. I guess to like continue on Nestle, like looking more into the company and finding like the corruption in like the little like hidden cracks and creases or whatever. So that was just like very eye-awakening and it's just like, it's not only Nestle, it's a lot of other companies doing a lot of other stuff because it's not only water. Um, I think something that we could make eight plays about water. You know, it's really hard to start making decisions about what to leave out because also everything, like this is our lives, right? So everything you leave out is also an important part of the whole story. And something that didn't make it in, into the larger version of the play is that when Chicago's water system was started, it was originally privatized and only went to the north side. Um, it had to get changed because we had the Clean Water Act, right? So it was like, people were dying because of that water system, but you know, then they were improving the water system that already exists and then quickly building it out to the south and west sides. So when we look at now where there are issues in water in Chicago and that the trend is on south and west side, that goes along, right? And that supports a lot of other sort of infrastructure support that we see in Chicago and um, disenfranchisement of our south and west sides, yeah. And just really quick, so I joined them a little later, so I got like pretty much the same thing you guys got. I was like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> Um, and I was really surprised to learn two things. There's some things that we left out in this short excerpt today. So we we're talking about the jails and the prisons and the water systems in the prisons and the fact that like no one talks about it. There's contamination in almost every prison that you've been in. I'm sure if you've ever been to a prison, you probably already know. Um, so that was something that like really hurt me and really stuck with me because it made her people too. Sorry, um, not sorry. Um, and then also that Nestle, I don't know if you got during Steal the Water, but that they take 400 gallons per minute for only $200 a year, which doesn't make any, like, if you're just gonna count the gallons that you take, like, in a minute, you might as well just pay that, you know what I mean? So that was just something insane from our river. Great, thank you so much for sharing. I am curious if some of you can speak to what it's been like um, working among your peers, being a youth ensemble and the power maybe it's given you to really figure out Yes, we are smart and we have something to say. So we were we've been working at this play in particular for um, ten months, but like um, everyone's new. There's people that's been here for like ever, and then there's people that's like, "Hi, it's my first show." <laughs> And I feel like as an ensemble, we're really like tightly knit. We're like family in a way. And I guess we learn a lot together too. So, I <laughs> um, so, oh my goodness. So I joined about like 10 months ago when the play started. And I was like, I don't know any of these people. But they're like, I know you. And then we, uh, yeah. So I just, they were really, I've not been in any other ensemble. <laughs> so this is my first ensemble ever. And um, I don't really know, but people, oh, some people tell me how theater school sucks and how, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Assembled today 
we don't have classrooms that look like this. So what does it mean for us to break those borders and find other ways so our students feel comfortable in these situations and also have the resources to actually be in these schools? I was like, I'll say something since we're talking about Columbia. Um, it was really refreshing and awesome to be part of this group just because it was awesome to see what they were able to create in such, well, I was gonna say a short amount of time, but they actually spent a lot of time working on it, so it was just really awesome. And I've never been part of something um, so important to me. Um, and this ensemble and Free Street versus like I go to Columbia College, Hilo, is just a new breath of fresh air and it's a lot of people who just want to make theater that matters and to touch other people and reach other people. And I feel like as a theater artist, very often we forget that element, the part of this is not just a fun thing, I'm dressing up for fun, this is actually important and I'm telling someone else's story. So for me, it was so important to finally be doing something to be telling someone else's story instead of just like flitting around a stage or whatever. Um, hello. Um, Free Street was my first ensemble I've ever been in. I didn't act before Free Street. Um, and I guess it was kind of out of my comfort zone, but in my comfort zone at the same time because uh, activism is a really big part of my life because like it's just like my family, like we're a very big activism family. Like my mom works at the Chicago Freedom School and stuff. And so it's like, uh, I, it's very in my comfort zone, but I was very scared of all these people. <laughs> like I was like, my first day like sitting in the lobby scared and I didn't know where to go and then like they were like who's in the lobby <laughs> what's going on and I like, walked into the theater and then like after like five minutes I was like I own this like I these are my family like I can do whatever I want say whatever I want and it was it was kind of crazy and like seeing like a bunch of new people come in like they were like in their shelves for like the same amount of time they were like sitting there like <laughs> and then they were like yelling at me two minutes later. So it's very nice and like it's just very diverse, which is also kind of crazy because I didn't like there's so many different schools and just stories between all of us. So yeah. I'm curious if someone could speak to Jerry G on the spot. <laughs> oh, what are other ways that you felt supported through working with Free Street? What are some of um, the things that have very much felt, uh, made you feel grounded in the room and taken care of? Um, so I've been with Free Street since I was 13 years old, and I'm 19. <laughs> so, uh, so I um, like Free Street is like the theater; it's an ASIM program, but it like it doesn't stop when you walk into the room or when you walk into the building of that room. It is like it's really like it goes throughout you when you go to bed, when you wake up. But it's like the it's like a beautiful thing because it's like Free Street is also a place in where which you gain identity. Where you gain a community and identity in within yourself. Like um, and when we like when we're not performing, which is like a uh, part of the time, another part when we are like talking about each other, we always have check-ins about what we're doing. So nothing is le always left at the door because sometimes as a, as a youth member, like having something left at the door is not enough for you. And it's like a place where we've all grown to know each other and know who we are and what we stand for as, as people and know that we are stronger in ways in which we may feel we, how we can. So that was like the greatest thing about it. Um, I definitely want to second the check-ins. Those are like fantastic and honestly the highlight of most of my Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. <laughs> um, <laughs> But another, another way that I feel supported is sort of that um, when we are presenting our, our, the things that we make, especially if it's in a very short amount of time, um, we, not only does the ensemble always, like do other people in the ensemble always go at you with sort of like a critically generous lens, we like to call it, um, <laughs> where it's like we're not just gonna deride each other's performances because like, oh, that sucks. Like, no, we want to give like actual helpful feedback and be supportive when we're doing that, but also we don't really take like crap. Like if someone's like not giving their 100% or they're not, like you can see that like they're not really invested in it. We not only will we be like, hey, like I, I noticed this, like could you try this? Like not only will we give those suggestions, but we'll also sort of make sure that the space that we are performing in is safe and is supportive enough um, 
to enable everyone to sort of give their 100%, and that's something that I really value because I think, I know for me and probably for everyone else up here, that's helped me grow as an artist and like made it feel safe to take risks that I haven't in other ensembles that I've been in. Sweet. I just want to say that they are amazing, if you didn't know. I don't know if you heard. Um, but um, the check-ins too, I think, um, I want to say a couple things if you're like working with youth or you're thinking about working with youth or being a teaching artist, like they are, yes they are in high school and yes that it means many things, but like the material I give them and everything that we bring them, we treat them as the same we would treat any of our multi-generational ensembles. We don't dumb it down, we don't omit material because they can't handle it, right? We make sure that we um, are pushing for the truth. And because of that, they are also, um, I don't think there's many days, like we try and really be like the support for them, but on the days that are really, really hard, they are like the most healing force I have. And um, if I'm like really, really, really in it, and I just say that, I'm like, y'all, I'm having a tough, tough day. They're, they're so good, they're like, can we give you a hug? <laughs> like, like, yes, you can give me a hug, we'll like big group hug, and then I'm fine, because they, they work hard, it's such a collective, um, and working from this place of just like really wanting to support one another that like I feel that I can be my best and I want to give them my best every day because like they are also holding me up and I think that like circle of holding each other up is really beautiful. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> I would love to open this up to the audience, so I'm gonna be running around with this mic, um, and if you can do some teamwork of passing things if I can. Is there anyone that has a question? Oh, cool. Wonderful. All the mics. So, Lindsay, could you find someone with a hand? <laughs> Hi. Thank you all so much. It was really, really powerful. And I guess the question I want to watch, or watch, ask, is um, your cohesion, the support that you've talked about is really clear and evident. And I would love to hear you talk about how you handle conflict in the room, because it inevitably comes up in theater, right? And it can make us better, but it's often really hard. And uh, clearly, like I said, your group, however you're doing it, you bring it, and, it and it makes your product better. So if you could talk a little bit about that, I'd love to hear it. Um, whenever anything happens, um, we talk about radical honesty and radical love a lot. So you have to listen. We hold a lot of just like accountability circles, I think, if anything happens, where first, if the people involved checking, I check in with them individually, ask them what they need, what they want, and then talk about how we're gonna have a group conversation about it. And then we bring it collectively to the group where we allow people to kind of just like make their, you know, I statement kind of things or how they feel or what they need and we have a working document of ensemble agreements um, where then out of that we're gonna make a new agreement right we're gonna go back to those um, but I think a thing that really helps I wouldn't say we have conflict that often and um, I think a big part of that is make it's not just the ensemble agreements are then like policed by us it's collectively we're all making sure and that we all agree, we all sign it together, and we really take those really seriously. We have a really long conversation about agreements, um, about critical generosity, understanding that we don't all come from the same experiences, what do we, how do we talk with each other when there is an experience that leads then to somewhere where we don't agree. But we also have exercises where we practice disagreement. That's one of the things we do in the first week is um, like spectrum exercises where we purposely make people disagree and then get into one-on-one -on -one conversations with each other. And that can be about something as simple as ice cream. Uh, we always start with that as an easy thing. Who, um, do you like ice cream? And people will be like, I hate ice cream, it makes me sick. And people are like, life would be meaningless without ice cream. And so we start from there and really building that in from the beginning. So then as things come up, um, we've already kind of practiced how to work with each other. So in the times where it's bigger than that, it really is about checking in with everyone's needs, circling up and making sure that we're moving on as a group and then healing as a group. So then checking back in on that as well. Does, anyone, does that sound? Mm -hmm. 
And I think you should make a space that conflict doesn't build up to the time it explodes and then release everything. And I think that's what the check-ins are for. We tell how our day went so that we understand where we're at and where, where our boundaries are so that we don't hold anything back and then let it build up until we can't deal with each other anymore. So it's about how you can uh, ease conflict making work every single day and not just wait till it happens. Fuck, what I do? <laughs> um, I feel like also like we have like the boundaries that are also like written into our agreements and stuff. And so like we always like have, not have to, but like we always like ask for consent. Like it's just become like a built in thing. Like, so we're not just like, I'm gonna hug you. We're like, can I hug you? You know, because like, sometimes you don't want that. And I feel like in theater, especially like ensembles, like other ensembles, it's like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna tickle you. I don't know. <laughs> like, they're very, very in your face and like touchy feely. And sometimes that's okay, but also like in our space, like it is, but you have to ask. Great, I'd love to see more questions. Any hands? Hello. Um, oh, that's really loud. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you for sharing this piece. It's so wonderful. Um, my question is to all of you, if during the creation process for the show, you had a favorite um, exercise or activity that helped you create materials or something that stood out to you during the process. I really love research. Like, <laughs> like, it really made me thrive. And, like, <laughs> and I feel like it really brought the show together. And although it's not like a like theater like exercise, but it's just like we want to bring you facts, not like. Well, like, we want to bring opinions too, but you're like, you need the facts, so that was fun. Um, I just like when Katrina, like, you know, <laughs> when she just throws stuff right at us. Like, it's great because, like, it just really forces you to get your gears grinding or whatever. Um, because, like, I'll just walk in and she'll be like, all right, so here's these three lines. You need to do this and this and this and that and make it go into this and that. And I'm like, all right. And then like <laughs> me and some or some like partners and stuff, we just like, we'll make something out of it in whatever time given. And maybe that will turn into something big. Maybe it won't, but sometimes it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, one of my favorite examples of that specifically is with the one of the scenes that you saw today that me and Deja did um, where we were digging a pool. Um, we, Katrina came to me and another one of our ensemble members who's not here, Nehru, and was like, uh, okay, you guys have to make this scene, um, around the word dig, and you have to say it three times, and then we were like, okay, um, and then we just did that, I don't know, like, we just sat down, and we were like, okay, let's, let's dig a happy pool, <laughs> um, and I don't know, it's just, it, it's very free, and that's something that I appreciate, it's, there aren't really any constraints, it's just take this and go with it. And it, if it works out, which it usually does, then it's like, okay, good for us. <laughs> Any other hands in the audience? Questions? Hi, um, first off, thank you so much for sharing your piece. You guys seriously give me hope for the future and what things will look like, um, you know, in the next generation or my generation. Yeah, um, but I'm wondering how all of you found Free Street Theater. Oh, Ooh, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I remember, uh, what grade was that? It was last year, freshman year. Um, uh, I was watching Glee with my mother, and she was like, oh, I love, I love theater. I want you to put, I want to put you in theater. I was like, I'd like to do theater. And then um, one of the old co-directors at the time was friends with my mom. And then they just talked, and my mom was like, okay, so I'm going to drop you off at Free Street. It's a place. I think you might get paid for it. I don't know. So just, like, walk in there and have a great time. I was like, I guess so. Um, so that's how I found it. Okay. Um, I first heard, well, I 
went to a show first, they invited me, but then I auditioned for it because um, I saw an Instagram post that my friend shared with me. Um, so social media, but I, think the, I don't think that was the important part. The important part was actually going to that space and then we started the rehearsal, playing games and creating stuff, and then I got hooked on it. Um, so I, I think that was when I found it, when I went to, uh, into that room and when I was being goofy and stuff, and during the check-in, the check-in was really important. I was like, oh, not comfortable, but thanks for sharing. <laughs> since I was in like fourth grade. Okay. I'm a sophomore now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. A big flex, no? <laughs> no. Um, and like, I've been through several ensembles and a lot of them were like pretty like basic, I guess. And um, <laughs> I guess like, I was just like, you know what, this is getting boring. And I like, I switch a lot because I'm very indecisive. So I didn't, I like, didn't like it. So I like, was like, oh, I'm gonna go apply. And then I was like, oh, Free Street. I was just like, that sounds pretty like artsy. So, <laughs> so I applied and I went to like the audition and then, yeah, here I am. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't noticed already, ready or heard, our retention rates are pretty high. So we just come one summer, come a fall, come a spring, and we keep on coming. But I, when I first started at Free Street, I was 14, my freshman year of high school, and now I just graduated. Oops. <laughs> but it was like, it was weird. So like before I started Free Sheet, I talked about this in one of my like rope drafts of a personal statement and my best friend remembers like the moment in my time applying to Free Street through ASM more than I do. But like before I started Free Sheet, I was like debate, logic, that's it. That's all I want to do with the rest of my life. And so it was like the summer right after my freshman year of high school, I was just applying to like programs on after school matters. And I don't remember like the other choices, but I do remember getting the, getting like being asked to come in for an interview. And then as soon as I come in for an interview, I'm like facing this girl, Claire. She's like a previous ensemble member, but I'm facing her and like, we're mirroring each other. And like, it was super awkward, but then it was fun. And then it was like an open space. And I came in on like one of the days that they actually had rehearsal. So everything was super authentic, super fresh and super nice. And Katrina over here was super nice. And I don't know, like that was like how I found Free Street. And then it was like, the space is what keeps me coming back and like, the consistency and the social justice aspect of it keeps me coming back. Uh, so I joined Free Street in 2013, like uh, before I graduated eighth grade. Uh, when I first joined, uh, no one was there. <laughs> I, I came at like the wrong time, but I was making it. I was making my own way there uh, by myself only, and I was just uh, interest. I've been interested in theater since I was also three, but like the thing was is like. Um, I think it's like when you walk in a room, you kind of like have a place where you know you belong. Like there's a place, like no one was there and that's like the beauty of it. That's how like even a room could captivate a person. Like I stepped into the room and uh, Free Street used to have like the, these black walls that were all like chalkboards and every youth member that would come in or weren't, weren't even members would draw on the board like randomly and it'd be like things that like you would never see. But like at the moment when I walked in, it was like I knew that like I want to be here. like I want to be here. I, I like I want I want to know like I want to do something important. I want to give back to somebody and let people know things are important because I like I like at 13 you don't really have like you have worries but it's like no one's hearing you. Yeah. So it was like the beauty of like being heard for the first time was like the beauty like the most amazing thing about Free Street when I first joined. Um, okay, so I joined the spring of my sophomore year, and now I've also graduated, shout out. Um, but uh, I joined because my friend Rivka, I did theater with her at my, my high school, and it was sucky. It was like so bad, and my director was just being really rude, and she was like, why don't you come try out Free Street? It's a lot more fun. It's a lot more fun. Um, it's like after school, it's not every day. Uh, and so I was like, okay, sure, awesome. Um, and then I got, I went to auditions, and I was like, oh, this is a party. Uh, and then, um, and one thing that I really loved, like, immediately about Free Street was also the focus on sort of social activism and social, like, consciousness, because I, I, in the theater that I did, like, it was very, uh, you know, I, I, I guess basic theater, like not, but not in the derogatory sense, just like it's what you expect theater to be. 
Um, and so going into Free Street just sort of uh, blew away all of my expectations and I got to engage a bunch of different parts of me, not only just like acting, but also creating and writing and researching as uh, Estrella said, I love that. Um, yeah. Oh, hi. Um, my story is a little different. So I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm not from here. Um, I came here for Columbia College Chicago. I'm a rising junior. Yep, had to think about it. Um, so I can tell you exactly where I was. It's really funny. It was a couple months ago. This is my first show here with Free Street. And I was sitting in one of my, uh, my directing one class and I had a friend, Will Petway, send me a text message that was like, hey dude, um, can you do the show for me? Also, can you be there at like five o'clock? Also, that's in like an hour. And I was like, Okay, yeah, well, uh-huh. And I literally biked my little bike all the way up to Free Street, and I didn't know anyone, and I just showed up, and I was like, hi, hello, my name's Deja. Can I, okay, cool. So um, this is the first ensemble that I've been a part of that is really good at like holding space, and I think that that's a really um, key part of their retention, right? Is that, like we said, when you step in, like you know that you belong, and you know that that's where you're supposed to be, and you're able to create whatever you wanna create, and we kinda just run with it. Um, so yeah, it was awesome. I loved it. And I'm also doing 50-50, so I guess I'm, you're stuck with me now. I'm sorry. Come see 50-50. It's going to be awesome this Sunday. How did you find Free Street? I, I, I want to make sure people have time for questions, yeah, and you can see me it. later, or, or I can, or we can say it, but I don't know. Yeah. Where we, have, asking we have about five minutes for Great. one like, brief question, Great. so if anyone is feeling inclined. Should I talk about Wonderful. Yeah, this so, weekend? Yes, if you can talk about this weekend. And Free Street is also, um, Koya Paz, the artistic director, is doing a session with um, Chloe Johnston on Friday at 2.30. So if you're interested in learning more about Free Street, there's time within the conference and on Sunday, which Katrina will talk about. Yeah, so Free Street, I'm just gonna give you like a little historical background real quick. Free Street came out of the 1968 riots here in Chicago, and a bunch of people came together and they said, uh, what's gonna make this city like rejuvenated and happy, and they were like a theater company. I think that's like the only time in history people were like, it's the theater company. And so um, Patrick Henry, our um, founder and artistic director back then, um, responded to a statistic that 90% of Chicagoans had not seen theater, and those were people predominantly on the south and west sides. And so decided that it needs to be free street theater. So they went in a truck down to the south and west sides and would just pop up and do performances that were free. So our work has always been free or pay what you can, and we always pay all of our artists. And so all of this comes from challenging the notion of where theater belongs and who belongs in a theater and what theater looks like. And so turning 50, you're like, how do we celebrate that? history of 50 years of that work and we decided to keep challenging ourselves and on Sunday we are performing in all 50 wards of Chicago in one day. Um, so we have 10, 11 cohorts of artists going out, they're each doing about five wards um, and doing five performances. So. Um, I feel like if I say all the information right now, you're just gonna need to look it up again later anyway. Uh, but Sunday, throughout the entire day, throughout the city, you can catch a performance. Each engagement is only an hour. And then we pack it up, we drive, and we go do another one. Um, and it is a mammoth of a project, but it's very exciting. And I hope that, I know the conference ends on Saturday, and I hope you are able to catch it. These folks, led by Zandra, will be doing some of the wards, um, and they'll be doing parts of Parched, and the rest of the groups um, are all responding to the prompt of, uh, what is still here? How do we survive? Yeah. Join me in thanking Free Street's youth and Sound. by a big park, we could picnic. Um, so so you, we may have to be kind of spreading out and finding corners in the building rather than elsewhere. I want to point out that there is sort of a loungy area in the basement. There's also sort of a loungy area on the fifth floor 
Um, we still have or the third floor, the third floor, and then there's the space on the fifth floor that we can use that will be our quiet space, but it is um, free for the lunch now, as well as in our two theaters. We ask you to be very polite and respectful and gather everything up uh, carefully. The other thing is that uh, just to make sure that people who have special eating prohibitions get their food, um, we ask that those who um, ordered a vegan, vegetarian, uh, gluten-free or kosher lunch, that you let them get their lunches first so that we make sure that their lunch just doesn't disappear in the shuffle. Um, and if you don't remember if you ordered a lunch, Lindsay will be out there and said she can tell you if you ordered a lunch or not. We may have a few left over at the end that we can sell you if you didn't get one. Um, and you are welcome to participate in the regional lunch whether or not you bought your lunch, so to find your person. So what I need right now is to get VPs from the regions to come up and I'm gonna hand you your, your region and I want you to kind of wave your hand so that other people from the region can find you um, and then you will find your region at lunch or if you're moving to a new region, maybe lunch with them. Um, 